Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce Jan Chong, who is graduating with her PhD from Stanford University. Uh, Jan is fairly unique in the universe. She is a computer scientist slash ethnographer. Um, so she sort of knows the business of software development from, from both sides, from having participated in it and from having observed it. Um, so today she's going to be sharing uh, some of her latest uh, findings from her ethnographic studies. And with that, here's Jan. Okay. Um, thank you. As Rob mentioned, I'm a doctoral student at Stanford University. I'm in the Department of Management Science and Engineering over there. And I wanted to talk a little bit about my background and kind of where I stand before I got into my uh, more technical portion of the presentation. Because as Rob said, I understand I'm actually somewhat unusual relative to most of the people you see um, here. So uh, my doctorate's in organization studies, I, though I also have a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in computer science, um, all from Stanford. I've been there for 10 years. Um, getting a little sick of it, actually. <laughs> but uh, um, so uh, what is organization studies? It's not, it's sort of an interdisciplinary field. It's sort of a small subfield, so not, people often don't know what it is. Like when I tell people what my PhD is in, they, they often have no clue what that means. Um, what it is, is it sort of sits between sociology and management. Most organization studies groups are actually inside business schools. So Stanford's already a little bit weird in that mine is in what is actually the industrial engineering department. Um, so we're sort of an industrial engineering department that's kind of pushing over to the sociology side of things. Um, and what it really is, is the study of human behavior on a collective level. That's a pretty broad scope, but that's kind of what it is. It ranges from very micro-level studies of how people interact in groups, almost social psychology sort of things, to these more macro studies that are very much more like macro sociology or macroeconomics, where you're looking at patterns of group behavior, you know, across all the companies, you know, all the startup companies in the Boston area, all the startup companies in the United States for a period of time, and seeing what patterns of behavior you see there. So kind of a wide range, um, eclectic group, draws on multiple types of um, methods, and covers a wide range of stuff. Um, even in this space, I'm a little weird. Um, how I ended up in here and in organization studies to begin with was actually because I wanted to study software development processes and wasn't really satisfied with the options I saw within computer science. Um, so prior to my PhD, as I mentioned, uh, I did work a couple times as a professional developer. Um, and what really struck me when I was out there programming professionally was how really little we seemed to know when I was on the ground working with people that are actually doing it day to day about the software development process. Um, I had spent a lot of time in school learning all this technical information, compilers, programming languages, you know, system architecture, trying to, to get all that information out there. But then when they actually send you out to go do work, you find out that like that's, I mean, it's not the easy part, but that's kind of the part you got covered. And there's this whole component to being able to actually create a product that works really well and do it within a time you know, that's reasonable to meet schedules that no one really ever covered, at least not at Stanford. Um, they, they just sort of nominally teach it to you. They're sort of like, do it. You guys can figure out that part. You know, we're going to teach you the really tough technical stuff. Um, and when I was out there working, um, when I asked people sort of like, why are you doing what you do? There weren't really good answers. People sort of were just like, well, that's kind of how it's done. And they'd make assertions about what was effective and what wasn't really effective. But there didn't seem to be sort of a lot of data behind it. And there wasn't a lot of research about there. And so when I started on my own, this is as a master's student, looking around just to see what people actually knew um, about these processes, I was kind of astonished to find that A, there wasn't very much, in my opinion. And B, what I could find really seemed to ignore what to me was the most critical part of the problem. There's a lot of looking at software development processes as sort of technical, right? Let's see metrics, what, what are the interdependencies that's happening here? And to me, it was like, well, actually, what's really happening is it's, it's actually a social process. It's a group process. It's about coordinating the efforts of multiple people together. Um, and so when I started really thinking about, well, where would I study this organization of studies? Who studies group behaviors? Well, organization of studies people do, and that's sort of how I ended up in that arena. So um, in terms of 
uh, that's how I got to organization studies. In terms of my specific research interests, what I'm interested in studying is different forms of software development work practices. And so for me in particular, what I've been looking at lately are agile methodologies. Um, so that includes uh, extreme programming, which I'll talk about today, pair programming, unit testing, open workspaces, just different ways in which people do software development work. Uh, theoretically, my approach is to think of software development as a process of collective knowledge sharing. So it's something where people know things. Uh, each developer on a team has some piece of the pie that they know, but in order for the team, team as a whole to produce the product, they need to be able to share that information effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and my goal for my work is to have three major um, uh, three major applications. I'd like to think that I contribute to the larger understanding of the software development process. Um, I also like to think that I provide developers and managers with some concrete information about the practices and methods that they're considering. Um, so if you're making the choice to adopt a practice or a method or a particular tool even to have some conce um, concept of what the consequences might be of those adoptions. Um, and then also to help inform the design of new tools and practices that might improve and support this process. Can you just say at a philosophical level sort of how your work or approach differs from sort of what people in what's classically known as experimental software engineering have done? I'm thinking of people like Big Basile who's you know, studied you know, his, uh, his whole um, factory for uh, knowledge, knowledge factory. So or looking at organizations and how they capture information and, and other people who've looked at things like code inspections and, you know, I mean, so there's there's been a sort of a wealth of work around around studying uh, people in, in groups in, in software development. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just I'm just wanting to understand sort of in the set in that set, at that setting where your work fits. Um, so when I read the stuff that I read, I, I mean, people aren't completely just unaware that it's no, a course. group process, right? Like that's in the back of my mind. But the focus has always been sort of like. Um, terms of what people, how they work together, like I've seen a lot of studies that are bake-offs, for instance, between two methods, right, and the evaluations I feel are sort of, well, I'll tell you what my criticism of the whole field when I started looking at it were. The first one was that I felt like they were sort of out of touch, right, it was a little bit like delayed, right, the newest stuff that was happening on the ground, it seemed to be more reactive, like you saw what people were doing and then, you know, would study, but there's this time delay between what that was happening, and so what I was kind of interested in doing was going out there and being as close to it as possible to see what, what people are immediately doing right away to provide feedback as soon as possible. So like for instance XP for me was a big interesting problem because I could see people starting to really think about these things and I wanted to go out and be like well what are you actually doing and how is that really affecting what you're doing. Um, and for me the second part was just more, I'd say less that people aren't necessarily cognizant of the social but more that Organizational studies is this really rich field of models of human behavior in a group process. And I thought, like, they've studied this so much in a different context, there must be some applicability, right? So it's not saying that, like, everyone in computer science got it wrong so much as that wasn't necessarily their focus, but this group has been studying it for, like, 50 to 100 years, so let's see what their models and their theories can really be brought into um, this particular application space without problem. So does that kind of help? Okay. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my current projects and not so to give some background as to what I'm going to present here. So in terms of working towards the sort of research goals that that I explained on the previous slide, um, I've done a couple different projects. I've been involved in several field studies of development teams. I actually think at this point I've done four uh, with four different teams. Uh, looking at different aspects of it. Knowledge sharing behaviors is what I'll be talking about today. I also did um, some other work earlier on interruption behaviors, also on XP and pair programming, or sorry, XP and waterfall teams. Um, and I've also kind of got some other stuff coming out that's on the social technical dynamics of pair programming specifically. So that's comparing um, behaviors on different pair programming teams, talk about what kind of factors in that company on those two teams uh, affect how people work together in pair programming environments. Um, and then some work that's actually partially sponsored by MSR uh, is doing both the field and an experimental comparison of pair programmer performance. And some of the stuff that we're thinking about looking at there is sort of decision making and information fidelity within these pairs. Um, so that's kind of what's on the plate. What I'm going to talk about today um, is the ethnographic work. Um, and this is, a, this is my dissertation work, so that's the heart of it. 
And it's a comparative ethnographic study of knowledge sharing behaviors on two software development teams, um, one of which uses extreme programming and one of which uses the waterfall method. So I don't know how familiar people are with XP, so I wanted to give a little bit of background in case they weren't. I give this you know, different talks to different audiences and you can never quite tell. So what XP is is this sort of new software development methodology uh, that's come out in the late 90s. Uh, Kent Beck wrote sort of the definitive book on it in 2000. Um, it uses some really radical software development practices. I've alluded to some of them. Um, programming work in pairs, working in a large open workspace. Those are sort of the two that I've been focusing on in the past couple of years, but they do have a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm going to explain a little bit more about the other practices, but I don't want to give you the full spectrum because that's I could talk about that for a full 60 minutes. Um, and the other team used what I'll call here the waterfall process, but is not really um, the true sort of waterfall process. It's sort of more the typical setup that you would see if you kind of picked a random company, what you're most likely to see that set of practices. Mm -hmm. What size of software systems um, are you uh, focusing? Are you focusing on the development, say, of a 100,000 line software system or a million line or 10 million line software system? Um, they're mid-sized. I don't actually, ha I had the line count somewhere. I don't remember exactly what that is. It's not, for instance, the size of, you know, Windows um, here, but this is going to, it's network management software. And so it includes sort of like, uh, um, I'm trying to think of what I could say without giving away the company. <laughs> um, uh, IP servers, that sort of thing. Like, um, so substantial code pretty complicated code and it has to work for a whole bunch of different situations. But and, and my other question is, are you developing software that has to meet a standard uh, or are you developing software that uh, is innovative and uh, there is no standard that it has to adhere to? Um, they have to deal with the network protocols, right? So they do have to work with the standards body and know quite a lot about that information. But in terms of the functionality, inside their, the different um, products that they have, they have some freedom to you know, try to come up with new features that might be interesting to, the cu to their customer base. Does that kind of give you a sense of where, where they are in that space? So they're not sort of like the cutting edge, let's be crazy, you know, let's come up with Gmail on your, you know, in your coffee cup that you can check while you run sort of space. Um, they're more part of an established system, um, but they have a little bit of freedom, so they're not just totally writing um, things. So um, to talk a little bit about uh, this study, what this particular study aims to look at three basic questions. Um, so first of all, what I wanted to do was just get a basic descriptive sense of where and when uh, developers seek information in the course of work. Um, there have been a couple studies in that space, but I thought, well, I'm doing this ethnographic study. Here's a really good opportunity to be like, okay, what do they actually turn to when they're working? What sources do they go to? Where are they looking? What kind of questions they're asking? Um, second, as I started really learning about extreme programming, I started to get really curious about how XP practices facilitate or impede knowledge sharing among the teams. Um, mostly this came out of a lot of conversations with people who are really into XP, XP proponents, and they give a lot of justifications for why you should use XP or why a particular practice works well together. And I really wanted to say, well, can you, know, can you back up that claim? If I go into you know, three XP teams, will I see that? And so I've started here with one um, to say, okay, well, what can we link the practices that, that are they're doing to actual knowledge sharing behaviors and what happens when we try to take a look at that? Um, and then finally, how can an understanding of knowledge sharing practices among developers help inform the design of work tools and management strategies? Of these three questions, what I'm going to talk about today are sort of the findings that are a bit most relevant to the second question. So the effective XP practices on knowledge sharing behaviors, although I'll touch a little bit about question three as I go through each um, of the findings there. Um, but before I get to that, let me tell you a little bit about the two teams in question. Um, so I conducted observations at two product teams in a mid-sized software development company <coughs> in Silicon Valley. So by mid-sized, it was a little bit bigger than what you typically consider a startup. It's about 100 people. Um, it'd been going for a couple years, probably I think it'd been around for about five to six years when I was there. Um, I spent a total of 10 months in the field with the two teams. I did a three-month pilot study with the XP team initially, um, just after they were formed, actually about a month after they came together. Um, and then seven months with the other two teams, and then so four months with the Waterfall team, and then I went back to the XP team a little bit later um, in their uh, development cycle. Uh, both of these teams worked on pretty closely related software. Um, so like I said, network management software designed primarily for network administrators. 
Um, uh, one team's project, this is the XP team, was written primarily in Java. The other team's project was primarily in Python. They use C, they use a little Java as well. Um, and in order to ensure that the behavior I observed on these teams wasn't particular to a particular phase in their development cycle, I stuck with both teams through one cycle of planning, design, implementation, and product release. Although not necessarily in that order because of time constraints. So um, to talk about the actual practices that these teams used, XP has between 12 to 14 like official practices depending on who you talk to. Um, the practices cover all different parts of the software development process, ranging from you know, how you should do project planning to how long your work week should ideally be. Um, so I won't address all of them, but just enough to give you a flavor um, of what I think is important to understand how work on this particular team unfolds. Um, in accordance to the XP specifications, project on this team was done in short two to three week iterations. Right? So at the beginning of each iteration, they would get a list of features that they wanted to implement, go through implementation, and it, theoretically at the end of the two week implementation, it was as if they'd completed a release that was ready to go to the customer, even if there wasn't an actual customer who was waiting for it. Um, Whenever possible, oh, each of the features that they picked for that iteration were then broken down into one or two day tasks that they then would put in a big queue and the developers would come and pull them off as they completed tasks. Whenever possible, the work on this team was done in pairs. So that means two developers would work side by side on a single shared machine. They had two monitors, two keyboards, but only one, and two mice, but one machine, and only one person could control the mouse or the keyboard at a particular time. And the pairs would do this very structured way of working on their tasks. They would first sit down to write test routines for the functionality that they hoped to implement. They would then design and implement the functionality. And then the idea was that when all your tests that you'd initially written passed, then you were done with that task and you could check in. And this cycle was pretty short. They tried to check in as quickly as, as often as possible. So they would be checking in multiple times a day. And the developers would switch pairs on a daily basis. So you'd work with one person on Monday, and even if your task took longer than Monday, it would stretch to Tuesday or Wednesday. The next day, you're working with a different partner. And the idea behind that was to help distribute the knowledge of that particular task across people on the team. Um, so, and the team was also located in a large open space, which I'll give you a picture of right here. This is actually an image of the XP team. Uh, that I studied, so you can kind of get a sense of the size of the space. It wasn't a really huge group, but you, what you see here is I think one, two, three, four, five, six different workstations and two sets of pairs working at that space. Some whiteboards along the side where they have written stuff on there. Um, they have some cardboards in the back, but they never use that. Like it didn't change the entire four months I was there. Uh, and so they have good visual and oral access to each other. You can see kind of how close they are. Yeah. How seasoned was this team with XP? Um, well, the team itself was brand new, but the people on the team, um, it got to about 10 people at one point, and the initial three had had no prior XP experience before joining this team, um, but uh, everyone else had. Okay. So they, it's not like they were kind of flying blind. They kind of knew what the deal was. And they had worked with XP at actually multiple different companies. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there a separation between um, developers and testers? Uh, yeah, actually what you can't see is there's some three docs they have on the side of the room over here and they put their project manager here, they put their tester here, they had two of them, at, um, they hired another one in the course of the observations and they had like a marketing kind of guy over there. Um, and initially the testers didn't like that because they weren't part of the XP team originally, they're part of the rest of the company, but over time like people just ended up relocating all their stuff inside the cube because they were inside this bullpen because they were working so closely with them. So I didn't explicitly follow them but a lot of what I watched from the developers was interacting with those people because they were right on site. Um, so, are any other questions about the XP team, I guess, before I go on? Yeah. How diverse were the teams, either gender wise or? Uh, Not very. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the testers was a woman on both teams, and one developer was female on the waterfall team. Yeah. The reason I ask this question is that in uh, academia there's a lot of interest in using extreme programming in the introductory course and there's a big discussion of should the teams be the uh, same gender or mixed genders and there are yeah. pros and cons of this. I was interested in that as well but then when you go out to actually find teams it's like well there's one woman so <laughs> like how much can you generalize from her yeah. So one quick question, any of the tools that the XP team used has been designed from the ground up to be a tool for extreme programming? 
Mm, yes and no. Um, they had a build system that they wrote themselves uh, specifically for that project and for their team. Um, they used the actual physical cardboard for a while, but their project manager didn't like it, so they actually bought a pre um, designed, it's called version one, it's a typical, like it's written for to support XP task management. It's a web-based application, they use that. So it wasn't customized to their team, that was off the shelf. Okay. Yeah. Actually the Waterfall team had more specific software, like they had built a lot of the systems themselves. So this is the Waterfall team, again they had the typical software development practices, not sort of strictly Waterfall. They had much longer iterations ranging from one to two months. Uh, they did do the linear task sequence, so at the beginning of an iteration, you would get a list of features, the whole group would generate a list of features based on the customer feedback. Um, and then the, they would split those features among the developers on the team, um, trying to match what so your previous expertise was. So if you've like, been working on databases for a year, you kind of got the database features. Um, and each developer would then write up a pretty long design document outlining what they intended to do to implement that feature that would get sent to the entire group and they'd have a big meeting where everyone would discuss it. You'd kind of lay out your design on the board and people would give critiques. You'd integrate that into your design document and then when everyone approved you would implement it um, and then test it. Uh, in the implementation phase, the developers would primarily work individually. They did consult each other. They'd wander over to people's cubes, ask questions via um, Lily, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but primarily you worked independently. Um, you had a lot of latitude over your work process, so you saw a little bit more variation in terms of specific practices. Um, just to give one example, like in terms of the times that people actually came to work, most people on the team kind of worked the typical 10 to 7, like the Silicon Valley 9 to 5, if you will, um, work day. But some people would stay overnight, just kind of like they just decide like, well, you know, I'm kind of gotten in a groove, it's like 9 o'clock, I'm just going to stay till like 6 a.m. and then take all Friday off. And they would just do that. And one guy actually kept like Australian time because his um, significant other was in Australia, so he just like wouldn't come in until morning in Australia and then he'd stay <laughs> until like night in Australia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually the other developers hated that, but <laughs> he did it anyway and they were, they were relatively cool with it. Um, <laughs> They had individual machines in their individual cubes, um, so that everyone had a cubicle. They tried to put people kind of close to each other. You couldn't really see what other people were doing around you, but you could easily, easily hear what was going around, around you. Um, and the team members on this team regularly worked from home. Um, they had two members that were remote. One was in Chicago, one was in Finland, actually. Um, but he was part-time. And what they used was Lily, which is a computer-mediated communication tool that's sort of a big chat room with different lines that you can subscribe to, so your team would have a line. And so whenever you send a message to that, everyone in the team would get that um, to keep in touch. And they really, they used Lily a lot. Um, like, they would be there on weekends at night. One told me that anytime I'm in front of a computer and awake, I'm on Lily. Um, so sort of. I think you might have to talk about this, but what were the uh, reporting structures? Were those constant? Two teams, or? Um, they both had one manager in charge of them. Does that make sense? Uh, I don't know. So they all reported to one manager? They all reported to one manager. No, 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 they each had their own right. manager. Okay. And so similar, very little established hierarchy. It's not like one had you know three sub-managers in charge of everyone. Did you observe the interactions between the teams and that manager? Um, I tried. Uh, the Waterfall team manager was the remote guy. He, I did observe him when he came on site. He would visit regularly because he was remote on site. But um, they kind of ended up mostly self-managing themselves. And I'd say the XP team was pretty much the same way. Like the managers on both teams were so busy kind of interfacing with either upper management or actually customers they needed to talk to that they weren't really there day to day to like handle like what are we going to do today. Yeah. Did uh, either team have a quality plan? Um, in terms of how to like assess quality and, and make improvements to like, like a TQM style thing? Well, quality in the sense that the object of the game is customer satisfaction. Mm, not really. Like the XP team talked about it a lot, but then actually didn't go out and find customers. Um, and the other team kept in touch with their customers, but had no real specific way, had no metric for, for how we're going to assess whether they're happy or not. Um, it, it's, a, I mean, despite the fact that it was established, it was still sort of in startup mode. Like they, especially among the management, had low bandwidth. I mean, they were so busy just dealing with people that their method was sort of like, if the customer isn't yelling at us, they must be happy. Um, that was sort of there. And similar build processes. And um, they both had automated build systems. The XP one was continuous throughout the day. The waterfall one ran every night. Um, it was a totally different system. They had built them both custom for the two teams. But uh, the big difference, I'd say, would be that the Waterfall team's system 
was heavily reliant on email notifications. So anytime someone checked in, it would send email to the entire group. Um, and this is something they actually read very carefully. They, they, they actually had a very good sense of any time someone made a change, what that change was. Um, versus the XP team, those, they didn't have that going on. So they, they actually just sort of everyone threw in check-ins. And they had an automated build that would just run. And they'd see whether things had failed. Mm -hmm. So how much of the different team behaviors that you observed you attribute to the difference between the processes, the development processes, XP and Waterfall, and how much do you attribute to the different the differences in the teams with the co-located and distributed team? Um, I'll, in 20 minutes, see if okay. you still have that question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so methodologically what I did, I visited each team weekly during their session. I sat there for three to five hours with them. The five, it, that includes like lunches and you know, coffee breaks and stuff like that. Um, I would sit behind the developer or the pair of developers as they work, and I took pretty extensive notes of the actions and the context of their actions, so whatever they were doing that day, why, what other stuff was going on in their environment to cause them to do that. Um, to kind of help, I used audio recording at all times in order to capture both dialogue and sort of ambient noises. That was actually really helpful. Um, what I would do is then transcribe this audio and integrate it with my notes to get a pretty detailed observation of each transcript, or trans just transcript of each observation. Um, these would run to almost like 40 pages each in terms of getting down pretty granular to what they're doing at any given time. Um, I would then reread and read to uh, search for larger themes that I saw were happening. Um, and then based on these themes, I would develop a criteria for identifying and categorizing recurring behaviors that were in uh, the data that should be related to my themes but weren't directly dependent on them to try to verify that this was in fact happening in a way that's more than just I sit there and I see it a lot, um, but also that I can support it with actual behaviors. Mm -hmm. Did you do anything to uh, protect against the Hawthorne effect that uh, your observations were going to affect the team behavior? Um, there's sort of a limited amount that you could do when you're going in to go sit behind them. I mean, they're very cognizant of what uh, they're being observed. I tried to observe every person two or three times to try to, so the very first observation I would always notice that people would be a little bit cagier, um, justifying what they're doing um, in terms of, of trying to, to justify and provide explanations for everything that were sort of like what you would expect, like the group norm, right? Like people would be like, I'm writing this because every good developer should write documentation, right? And then like I'd come back two more times and they never write any more documentation. Um, or often, for instance, one guy was always on Lily whenever I was in, uh, observing anyone else. Like they have their windows up so I can see all the, the chats that are going to this line. And like when I wasn't observing him, he was like constantly sending messages to the group line. The first time I observed him, like he didn't send a message all day. So, right? you're, <laughs> so, so you're saying that over time you think the effect of the Yeah, so I would try to go, I, I went to everyone multiple times in order to make sure that, that and then if, if, for instance, their first day's behavior was like really too crazy, I would throw it out. I wouldn't actually even consider it. It would just be like, well, that was the warm-up for observations. Yeah? Maybe I missed this. How many visits total did you have? You said three, five hours, but... It's hard to remember. Um, I think I have 18 for one team, and then around 15 for the other. But that doesn't include the pilot um, data. And How some many on, each team? on each team, the XP they both varied. The XP team ranged between seven and ten people, and the waterfall team I think was between six and eight. So I didn't get a chance to observe everyone. Like for instance, the Australian time guy just never managed to get that one. Um, he wasn't he didn't respond to email, and so I never got to talk to him. But uh, I tried to get everyone there multiple times again to get back to what their standard practice was and not just what they thought they should be doing when being observed. For the XP team, actually, I didn't do that as much because it was really easy. They were actually really, they're used to being in this environment where there are all these people watching them, right, like because they're in that space. So they, they were very really capable of ignoring me. Like I was like ignore me and they pretty much did um, the other time. So I kind of felt that that was not, not such a problem. And with um, the XP team, did you still sit behind one particular person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still stuck with a particular pair. I tried a couple different things during the pilots, and it, it just seemed more to work better, where you're like, OK, I'm going to focus on this one person um, and go with it. In terms of coding for behaviors to back up sort of themes, what I did was I went and looked at knowledge sharing behaviors. So I thought, OK, well, what I'm interested in is knowledge sharing. What can I see that they're tangibly doing um, that I can look for and then kind of explore how it relates to the practices they're doing? Um, and so I kind of broke knowledge sharing down into two components. Right? I thought, OK, you have two people, and they need to 
exchange knowledge. There are two ways that it can happen. I can either go find you because I know that you have or think that you have some information that I need so I can go seek knowledge. Or um, oftentimes people will just tell you stuff. Right? Like you won't have asked, but people will come up to you and be like, hey, I think that this might be relevant to you or just kind of you know, give you information. And so that's knowledge offering. So these are the two events that I categorized for. I basically looked for um, very explicit acts. So it had to be something that was marked by an explicit question from one person to another. Um, and that's, uh, I can talk a little bit more in detail about that when I get to how I use these. Um, and I also looked at knowledge externalization, um, which is just my fancy word for whenever they wrote stuff down. So I was really interested in what they were trying to record. Um, I also actually looked at whenever they looked at recorded knowledge, but that I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, um, and then just to give you an idea of how many events that were going on on each team, on the XP team I saw a total of 840 events across these two categories. Um, 543 knowledge seeking, 214 knowledge offering, 83 um, knowledge externalization. On the waterfall team, 245 events, um, 109 knowledge seeking, 69 offering, and 67 externalization. Mm -hmm. So, Jan, did you get a sense of how much time did they actually spend programming versus non-programming? Activities? That wasn't my goal, but um, I haven't actually done the actual time breakdown of that in terms of, of calculating. Um, I have some numbers that talk to you about like, what phase of the programming activity they're sort of in, um, but they're, in, they're very rough, a sense. Um, but their default activity... It's hard to break it out because they'll, they'll turn and then they'll come back and so it's like, well, you end up being like, okay, well, for 30 seconds there they stopped and then they're back. Or do you count that as part of the programming activity? Um, which is why I haven't gone and refined that further. Um, by default, though, I think most of the time they're pretty much programming. I mean, do you mean programming in terms of they're actually generating code or doing related things to code generation? Like, well, Watts Humphrey did this study where he discovered people spent maybe a quarter, at most a quarter of their time in a 40 hour week writing a program. The rest of it was due to other activities. I was like just curious as to what Testing, for instance, does that count as programming? Or? No, no, a good chunk of it was being in meetings and knowledge sharing. Oh, yeah. No, these guys had one meeting every morning, and that was kind of it. Um, so, of their time, that. that uh, not so much. On the XP side, they're talking all the time to each other and to other people. So, it's like hard to say when did they stop and when were they programming, when were they not programming. On the waterfall time, they mostly worked alone, and the time when they deviated from that was very specific. They didn't spend a lot of time having meetings with each other, and they didn't have a lot of time going over and talking to each other. I would say mostly, actually, if they deviated from it, they were goofing off. Um, so, I, I mean, like, I sat behind people while they were watching, like, I watched Star Trek videos um, behind people and stuff like that, but it wasn't taken up by meeting activity. Okay. So to kind of preview what I found, um, hold on a second, I'm going to a couple page. Um, what I'm going to talk about today are two principal themes that I saw going on in the two teams. Um, the first team that emerged was the XP practices seem to make technical design and status knowledge much more transparent among the team members than the waterfall uh, practices did for the waterfall team members. So for each of these findings, what I'm going to do is present some qualitative data, drawing on some vignettes and very illustrative events that happened to kind of illustrate how the practices might lead to this transparency um, for this one. And then what I'll try to do is look at how this transparency is also reflected in the pattern of knowledge sharing behaviors on the two teams. Um, for this one and specifically, I'm going to look at the pattern of knowledge offering incidents and knowledge, sharing, knowledge seeking incidences. And the second theme that I'm going to talk about today is that although knowledge may be much more prevalent on this few teams, on the XP team, the XP model of knowledge distribution also appears to be more lossy than the waterfall uh, model of knowledge distribution. Um, which is to say that, that although they know at any given point of time what's going on on their team, they don't retain that information very well from, say, week to week. Um, and the lossy nature of this knowledge, again, I'm just going to say that it's uh, reflected in the content of what they're recording on these two teams, which is not the perfect measure, but it's sort of a small window into to what, what's going on there. Okay, so XP's got a lot of practices, so I'm just going to talk about the two biggest contributors to knowledge transparency here, uh, pair programming and open workspace. So pair programming was a rich source of knowledge transparency on the XP team. Paired work provides a rich situated exposure into the, technology, uh, the technical and design knowledge that other people possess. Um, and this example is a pretty typical exchange between two programmers here, Andy and Brian. They're, what they're going to do is they're constructing a chain of logic to explain why a change that they've made to the code um, does not fix a failing uh, test. And so that's what they're doing at the very beginning. They've made a change, they're running it, and they say, okay, well, 
it still fails. Why is that? Um, what you can see through this dialogue is that knowledge is made visible across pair partners as each programmer articulates their thoughts about the current task. So one guy is kind of giving their hypothesis and confirming um, the other person's assessment or altering it. This practice not only facilitates the sharing of factual technical information, there's kind of an example of that here at the very bottom where Andy starts looking for a place to put the test. He doesn't explicitly ask, but Brian says, no, actually, there's a better place for that. We should do that in the persis persistence test case instead. Um, but on a more fundamental level, what it's really making visible is the process of reasoning inherent in code design, which if you think about it in more traditional programming environments, is usually obscured, right? Like you don't get to see that. In fact, what you usually see is sort of the end result, the, the finished code, and then you have to sort of guess at why they made the decisions they did there. And here they're kind of seeing the whole process in situ. Um, they get to see, for instance, what aspects of the problem become salient when you're actually approaching, you know, write a function that will do this or, or add this functionality to the program. Um, and how people renegotiate and reconceptualize problem constraints in order to construct a working solution. Stuff that, again, is just simply not really available on the waterfall side or has to be gleaned post hoc. In addition to pairing, the practice of working in a shared open workspace served to not only make the status of the people around them more visible across the team, but facilitated knowledge sharing across team members. Um, as knowledgeable developers could provide information to those around them, even when not directly addressed. So here in this example, what's going to happen is they're in the space, they have the build monitor on one side of the room, and in this case, one of the builds failed, so the monitor's flashing red to indicate that, that there's something wrong. And Carl's walking across, or sorry, Darren's walking across the room, and he sees the build monitor, he's going to stop, turn towards it, start walking towards it, and reach for the mouse that kind of like lets you bring up the more specific display about what tests are failing. Carl's sitting on the side of the room, he's already been working on this problem, sees Darren working, says, hey, I know what that problem is, right? Darren says, yeah, and he says, I'm going to go restart it, it's a strange timeout thing, I don't really know why it's happening on Solaris, but it does, I'm working on it, you know, here's what's going to happen. So here, again, Darren never asked anyone, he never asked Carl what was going on with the build, Carl just sees what he's doing, knows what information he's trying to get, can infer that reasonably well, and is able to provide a solution, for, uh, or provide information that he wants. So developers can actually glean a pretty impressive amount of information from these channels. Uh, I had a pretty long vignette I'm not going to sh show, I'm just going to tell you what happened because it takes two slides, <laughs> um, during which a pair of developers in this environment were working on this bug. It got really frustrated. It was they'd been working on it all day. It turned out actually to be a change unrelated to their code, which is why they're having so much trouble fixing it. Um, but in the middle of it, they got so frustrated that one of them just kind of like got up and walked out of the room because he was so pissed off. He was like, oh, I can't deal with this anymore. And he just stomped out of the room. And the other guy was like, what do I do now? <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm working by myself. And what you saw was that the people working around them kind of like proactively just came in and started taking over the task when they saw that this pair had become unfunctional anymore, right? Like literally the people next to him just moved in and it instantly started being like, okay, let's look at this file, run this test, let's see what's going to happen. There was no sort of period of, what are you doing? What's the problem? What have you done already? They were able to glean that just from being around them, which is really pretty cool. Um, oh, I put the slides in there. Well, oh well. Um, the waterfall team. Um, has a very different pattern of behavior. The channels, again, for design and technical knowledge are simply unavailable there. Uh, status information is available, but in sort of this temporally limited fashion. So what they kind of do is they do periodic broadcasts from other team members announcing progress. That's a very common behavior on this team. So as you see here at the top example, Jack's looking over something. He gets a message from Kate, who's just telling him that he's fixed a compiler bug on one of, their, uh, one of the uh, bugs on one of the builds that's causing it to not compile. Um, and, uh, and also through the automated notifications that their build system sends out that people pay close attention to because that's one of the limited ways that they can get that information. Um, both of these mechanisms are, however, fundamentally voluntary. Like, if I don't check in my code into the CVS share for like two weeks, you don't really know, and if I'm not telling you what's going on, you don't know what I'm doing. Um, developers like to be seen as competent. This is true on both teams. They don't like to kind of like tell people, like, well, I was writing this and I hit seven bugs and I really don't know what to do. Uh, they prefer instead to actually, whenever they run into issues like that, they'd usually try to fix it themselves before they wanted to tell people to try to be like, oh, I'm all over it. Um, in this bottom example, what's happening is a developer named Lay is receiving these pretty frantic messages from the rest of the group over Lily because he's checked in code that doesn't have a set of changes that he's actually promised to make, um, and they need those changes before they can release the code to the customer uh, who's actually just waiting for the product. This was a deployed product, so they're giving real-time updates out there. But Lay, who's been delayed by some unexpected bugs in the code, is just not responding to queries. Like, I, I don't know why, um, but 
people are coming in to the, asking him questions and he's just kind of like, no, I'm on it, it'll be fine. And when they're like, when are you going to check in? He keeps going soon. And then same with these messages that are coming in over Lily, he kind of reads them and sort of like um, ignores them. But what you see here is that because he's unwilling to give out this information, the team around him is pretty limited in what they can learn about the situation. Um, by contrast, if you think about that vignette that I talked about on the XP team, even though those developers also did not want to give out information that indicated that they were in trouble, they couldn't really hide it. Like everyone on the team around them knew it and could see exactly kind of what their problem was. So the differences in knowledge transparency that are engendered by these work practices is also reflected in the aggregate pattern of knowledge sharing behaviors on the two teams. So to remind you, what we're looking at here is all the times in the data when a programmer asked another programmer for information. Um, what type of program information did they ask for? This is sort of, oh, the colors really didn't come out very well in the projector. Um, but what I did was a pretty rough coding. I didn't splice in to say which module you're asking questions about. I could, but um, haven't done that yet. It's mostly high level. Is it technical information? Is it coordination information? Is it status information? Or is it miscellaneous information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so coordination information is when you're splitting up division of labor between two people. So you're saying, I'm going to do this, or are you going to do that? Status is sort of, what's the progress on that so far? Um, technical is anything related, why, how does this work, you know, why is this code working this way, what is the protocol for this, um, and miscellaneous is anything else ranging from things like how's your dog, you know, that kind of information over there. Um, so here we have the distribution of question content on the two teams, and as you can see, the XP knowledge seeking events are predominantly technical in nature, at 77%, and the largest category on the waterfall side is also technical queries, about 50% of all the seeking incidents that, that I observed. The most telling difference between these two lies in the secondary categories. Developers on both teams seek out coordination information, 15% of the time on the XP team, 25% on the waterfall time. But the waterfall developers inquire about status to a much, much higher degree. 17% of their queries involve asking other people what their status is. There's only 4% of that happens on the XP, and most of these are conversational turns, saying, oh, what are you doing right now? Um, as opposed to the waterfall side, where they're really saying, like, what's going on? Please tell me what, what's, what's happening there. So um, this reflects the ready availability of status information on the XP side and the need to offset the opacity of status information on the waterfall side through explicit questions about status. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you're looking at these as pie charts, as percentage of uh, yeah. total, and is that the right thing? Is that the right way to be comparing, you know, 7% to 15%, or, or is it really absolute numbers that you want, number per unit time? Number per unit time? I, c I could do that. Um, what would that add? Doing number per unit um, time. So, assuming the number of people is the same and the, the amount of time is the same, so just control for that. Um, if XP people are, um, if you still have, okay, if XP people are asking much more about technical questions mm -hmm. than, than waterfall people in absolute numbers, and it appears that they are by an overwhelming majority, does that mean that? That, that could mean two things. One is that <clears throat> there's much more accessibility, so they ask those mm -hmm. questions. And the other is exactly. that there's a whole lot less information, so they need to ask. OK. I got you. So you're trying, but, saying the numbers the don't really. Percentage. Yeah. I, so to compare, I normalized the numbers on the two. Right, so it's adjusted for the amount of time that I saw the two teams. So that's a, that's a normalized number. Okay. Um, the XP side gets normalized. But it turns out I saw them for a few hours. I had less observations with them, but they actually had still raw numbers, more events on the, the XP side. Um, a lot of this is pair programmers between each other. And so what, when I initially did this analysis, I actually did it only across pairs. And I, I think I might have the slide, I'm not sure, to look at, well, accessibility, right? The person next to you is so accessible and in the course of working together you would by default ask them questions, right? So is that really valid? And I kind of went back and forth and it turns out whenever I present it without the pairs, people say, what do the pairs do? Um, so for this one I tried to put it all together and uh, people are like, what, what do you do without the pairs? So maybe I'll just have to show both. Um, but I do have the numbers in the proportion, the number of technical queries decreases a little, I think it goes to about here on the XP side, but the relative proportion stays the same across people. So this is, if you think of it in terms of when you have to go outside of the people you're most accessible to, right, you still see that same pattern. Yeah? How many of the 
questions that were going between the people in the pairs were really just instances of distributed cognition where they were just using the other as a crutch as opposed to actually really asking a real question. So this doesn't reflect every question that was asked. Right? I actually used a metric a bit similar to what you guys did for the information needs, which is just they're, they're chunked into if you ask a question that starts a knowledge sharing incident, right? And then there's some judgment involved in saying, when do you actually switch to a new task? And I actually drew on your categories um, to try to help make that determination to say, okay, well, when am I seeing a totally new instance? So like, if you're in a meeting and all of a sudden you say, wait, you know, I want to talk about this. Can I ask a few questions about that? That's new, right? That would be a separate one. But I don't code every single question. So if you're talking to each other in, in the course of banter, right, then, um, and then that's not counted as four. That would just be, say, one, whichever initiated. And I tried to be a little conservative, actually, about it, just to make sure I didn't get the noise um, in there. So I only picked them if they were very clear examples of a knowledge-seeking incident. Like, I don't know this, and I need that information. Uh, yeah? How would you, or did you look at sort of learning over time? I'm thinking that in the XP, one way to characterize XP is you could think of it as a, an apprenticeship model. Uh -huh. that no matter how people are paired up, there's going to be one person who has some expertise. I mean, it could go both ways. It's not necessarily, you know, one superior to the other, mm -hmm. or, you know, or the teacher and the other is the student. Uh, and, and sort of over time, you know, the hope is with something like XP or the hypothesis is that everybody becomes more expert in all parts of the system, whereas waterfall, you tend to, your expertise tends to be more compartmentalized. And so I just wonder sort of, uh, is there a way to look at learning, like, like having a test you know, at the beginning and the end, or, or so there's knowledge, but then there's sort of what do what do people retain? Mm -hmm. So I didn't do that explicitly here. It is one of the questions that I was really interested in, but methodologically, I was like, I'm biting off a big piece already. So you know, next study. Um, what I did do that sort of addresses that is I looked at not uh, it uses these observations, but also a second XP team to see what the dynamics were on the two. And the one that we found that was really interesting is on that team, they had a project structure that had a hardware component and a software component um, to it, like code that worked very closely with the hardware product that they were making and then the software that allowed people to control it. But the team was responsible for both parties. But you saw a clear divide in terms of the developers on that team who were really the hardware gurus and the developers on the team that were software gurus. And when you paired across that, expertise level, like when you had one person who was really strong in one versus someone who was really weak in the other, um, it was actually what I might call dysfunctional pair behavior would happen, which is that the expert just started taking over the entire task, and the second person wasn't really contributing much to it at, at all. So that's sort of not precisely your question, but sort of what I've kind of found in, in different other areas. That makes sense. Oh, any other questions? Yeah? How does the knowledge sharing behavior vary in time for the life of the project? Um, I didn't look at that yet. I could. I have that data, but I have not. I've run a lot of other numbers, though. Okay. Um, so that's next on the list. The other problem I was thinking about doing the learning one, it was really tough to get, like, the pairs pick themselves ad hoc every morning. So it was really tough to come in and be like, no, I want to see you and you work together because I know last week you worked on this and I want to see whether, you know, because I know you're not that expert in that area. So that, it, you know, this wasn't best suited to answer that, yeah. But just uh, following up on Tom's question, uh, uh, there are studies indicated that the difference in productivity between programmers can be as much as a factor of 50 to 1. Mm -hmm. um, what happens when you have two a uh, pair that one is just so much more experienced and productive than the other? Is that also dysfunctional? Yeah. What happens, well, it was more related to how much they knew about the the topic, the task at hand. Um, so like if you had someone who was really, basically what it is is that if you have a non-dysfunctional pair, at least in the, all the observations that I've seen, they kind of come up to this level of productivity. The XP guys are really focused. Um, they're pretty much working all of the time. Like I couldn't tell you whether they're producing quality code for the time they are, because I couldn't get the code from the two teams that I looked at. But in terms of actual just focused work, on uh, the programming task, they're doing that for the entire eight hour day whenever you have a pair. The dysfunction happens when, that happens is when one guy knows so much more that the other guy feels like they're slowing the whole pair down too much if they try to ask questions to come up to speed. But if they know enough to ask informed questions, right, they don't have to be equal, they just have to be kind of like enough in the space that you're not saying like, oh, explain to me what this is at a very basic level, then they actually end up contributing and functioning as a pretty, you know, reasonably high function. They end up looking sort of like as a normal pair. Um, 
uh, on the waterfall team, you can see huge differences, sort of what is more documented in, in these studies, where you have some people that are focused, they're productive, they come to work the full three hours that I observed them, they were writing code the whole time, they were very productive, they would get stuck periodically, think about it, and then immediately move. And then you had these guys that were literally like, every 15 minutes were doing something else, right? Like they were like watching videos, they were talking about stuff, talking to me, trying to talk to other people. And so that's kind of what I noticed in terms of productivity. I did not assess the quality of what they were writing. So I didn't say like maybe in the 15 minutes that they did work, they were brilliant stuff. You know, whereas the other guys churning out crap for three hours. And, and did you collect any objective metrics like number of finished lines of code produced per hour between the two different projects? No, I couldn't get into their CDS share. I really want. I really tried <laughs> to be able to run some numerical analyses on what code was being entered. The most I could get was through interviews. People would tell me I had talked to a couple of the managers that kind of saw both teams, and they would say this team is phenomenally more productive in terms of lines of code generated than that team. Like if you just look at the amount that's being added to the code base every week. That was the best I could do for this one. And I thought, well, I have so much other data. Let me look at those phenomena and then try to maybe design a different study that would let me assess, you know, uh, maybe even more experimental. Because again, it's also hard to compare when you have two different projects to a certain extent, right, about what's going on. So I tried to look at behaviors that I could say, you know, the interdependence across these two teams is reasonably similar, or, you know, the, the types of project knowledge they have to need the, is, is reasonably similar, so I can make these more high-level comparisons. Yeah? But you can still look at, uh, in the delivered system, the number of lines of code that went out in the first version, mm -hmm. and then look at the number of programmers, uh, how much programming effort went into each, yeah. to see if there were any significant differences in terms of productivity of the two different uh, methodologies. I definitely could do that. It's a little harder on the waterfall side because, like I said, they worked so sporadically that it's hard to say what were your number of programming hours. Like, the guy would be like, well, I was on Lily all night. I answered, like, 10 questions from support between, like, midnight and 4 a.m., you know, and then on the weekend I did, like, a little work, and he's like, in my mind that counts as work, but it's definitely something I could look into to doing because I do have the, the, the data for that, and if I could go back and at least get the lines of code. It's, a, uh -huh. it's just a striking data point about the amount that the waterfall spends on status. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're just it's information that they need, and they, they have to get it by asking people. So. And a uh, curiosity was Lily usually how they did status information? Um, a bit both. As it got more urgent, they would start showing up in person. Okay. Um, but yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Pausing your talk. Yeah, um, cool. In the. The graphs here, are they multiplied by, are the numbers multiplied by the time of each interaction? Yeah. So this is time that you're... Oh, no, no. It's classifying. it's not time. It's actually number of events. So I don't I don't look at how long the events go for. I, I want it to, but it's like, I mean, 543 ended up being so high that I couldn't really stop and get times for each one. But I mean, I don't know if you remember my interruption study that I actually did get times for those because I had like 242, I think, and that was manageable. But these the numbers were so high that I was like, I'd like to graduate this year. <laughs> okay, um, so that was seeking behavior. The difference um, is also perhaps more dramatically visible if we look at the information the developers are voluntarily telling each other. So here are all the knowledge of volunteering events sorted by relevance to the target. So if I'm telling you something, right, relevance to whatever you're currently doing. Um, if, I'm, if what I'm telling you solves the immediate problem that you're working on or that you're facing, then I consider this knowledge to be timely. So that's what the timely category means. So for instance, in that open workspace example where Darren's actually going and looking to see why the build fails, Carl tells him that maybe not exactly why the build fails, but that he's on it and that, you know, a rough explanation of what he knows about that, that would be really timely knowledge. Um, if it's relevant to your task, so generally related to what you're working on, but not immediately relevant to the problem at hand, I consider it to be task relevant knowledge. If it's um, relevant to the larger project you're working on, but not your specific task or your immediate problem, then it's considered project relevant knowledge, and then there's some of it that's just totally random knowledge. Uh, so the difference in the relevance of the knowledge offered on the two teams is striking. 71% of the knowledge offered between the developers on the XP team is timely in nature. So that's knowledge directly relevant to the problem faced by the person to whom the knowledge is offered. Another 12% of that is task relevant knowledge, and another 10% is project relevant knowledge. On the waterfall side, however, only 17% of the knowledge offering incidences are timely knowledge, uh, timely knowledge offering incidences. Instead, 32 and 34% of them are task relevant and project relevant, respectively. Um, yeah? Good question. On the XP side, does that include the, the offering between the partners? Mm-hmm. 
And again, same thing when I reduce out the, when I take out the pairs, the proportion stays the same even though it just lessens. Um, the timeliness lessens, but it's still extremely timely across pairs. And if you look so. between pairs, how do the absolute numbers compare? Uh, if I look in terms of, they're still if higher. You take XP as a yeah. Thing. Yeah, they're still higher. They're still higher than I don't remember the magnitude. Kind of it's I think a factor of three if you take that oh, out. Really? It's still much much higher. Yeah, enough that I wasn't like this is you know clearly only a pair thing. Enough that it's <coughs> pretty clear. I could put up the slide with that, and you'd probably say like, wow, that's still a pretty big difference. Yeah. So unlike the categorization we had on the previous slide. This one I'm a little bit more worried about external validity of your mm -hmm. of your categorization here. Yeah. So did you do anything to try to probe whether whether they would have categorized the same way that you did? Well, the way I kind of did it was if it's the person that I'm watching, like if that solves their problem and they move on, right, to a different problem, then I can clearly consider that timely. And again, I tried to be really conservative about that. Um, the one thing I couldn't really tell you is like maybe they're blasting information that's relevant but like kind of crappy, right? Like mm -hmm. that could bite you later on. And I, in many of the cases, I I tried to do that initially, but I just didn't know enough about kind of the the deep internals of their project to be able to assess that necessarily. And often they wouldn't even know. Like it could just be bad information and it wouldn't come out for a couple of days, right? So I stuck with the the relevant okay. stuff. And what so. about the difference between task and project relevant? That was a little bit easier because they actually every morning I'd say, "What's your task?" Right, okay. and so they tell me what that was, so it was easy for me to say, like, okay, well, this is clearly related to what you're doing um, versus not related to what you're working on today. Any other questions about this? Um, so, let's see, where was I? Um, because XP practices make knowledge more transparent, the developers on the XP team are able to regularly direct immediately re relevant knowledge to their peers to precisely answer the questions that they're being faced by their teammates. And like I said before, these are very specific. I picked the, I mean, I only went with what was a very clear example of knowledge being needed. Like, I wouldn't consider it timely knowledge if it wasn't. Like, usually it's like, for instance, I don't know where the log files are on this pro you know, in this part of the project, or you'll see someone just searching and saying things like, oh, there's a log file over here, and someone will come in and say, the log files are actually in this directory, and they'll actually sit down at the computer and show them. It's stuff like that. So pretty clear cut, it's not like a vague, um, those are the types of questions that are being answered. Um, on the waterfall teams, the developers also try to offer knowledge. So it's not that one team is more helpful than the other, right? They're both trying to help. Um, each other on a regular basis, but they lack the same context as the XP developers, and instead they're directing their knowledge based on what they know of the developer's current task or the project, or sometimes they're just kind of randomly broadcasting information out there that they think might be useful to each other. And that would, a lot of that happens on the Lily line. They'll just send information that's like, hey, this is going on, what, what's up um, with that? Okay. Knowledge offerings of particularly interesting categories of behaviors to look at, because unlike seeking, where the person who wants to have information um, has to have some idea of who they might go to in order to get an answer. What's happening here is not, the answer is coming to you. You're just saying, here's my problem. You're not even necessarily actively saying, here's my problem. You're just trying to work out a problem, and the answer is coming to you um, from the people who have that information. But lest we um, immediately rush to convert all of our teams to XP methods, uh, while knowledge on the XP team is more transparent in the moment, this knowledge is also less permanent on the XP team. Um, this lossiness can be traced back to XP's model of knowledge retention. So XP issues documentation practices, so they don't write code comments, they believe in writing self-document code, self-documenting code, they don't write design documents. Um, in general, the idea is that the design documents grow too rapidly out of date to be worth maintaining. Um, technically, technical and design knowledge is therefore quite deliberately on this team centered primarily on two places, in the minds of the developers on the team and in the project code artifact itself. Excuse me. Several XP practices, pair programming, um, particularly the switching component of pair programming, open workspace, the daily stand-up meetings are intended to facilitate the communication of knowledge about code across as many programmers on the team as possible. But the drawback of relying entirely on the human mind is twofold. First of all, the mind's lossy. Knowledge degrades over time in the absence of repeated use. And if knowledge is retained only in the minds of others, then that knowledge is inaccessible when those minds are inaccessible. If someone's physically out of the room, you can't get what, at what they know. Second, mental capacity is far from infinite. Like, we all can't know everything. So the amount of information, as that increases, the amount of information that people need to maintain, people begin to get overloaded. 
and so that even if that information is readily available through, to them through the practices, they may not retain it. You convinced me that XP is knowledge lossy, but is what well, is the other team you studied knowledge? Re, do they have knowledge in institutional memory? Kind of, and I'll try to talk about the ways in which they kind of make the job easier for themselves, but that they're maybe not capturing everything either. Um, so to give examples of this, a pattern of behavior that began to occur fairly regularly towards the end of my observations with the XP team. So remember I saw them at the very beginning, I saw them and then my second set was sort of about a year and a half into their existence, um, was one where design decisions were being unintentionally revisited. And this was something that I could sort of for the second half of my observations, I would see at least one instance of every single day. So not enough to do a count, sort of like it's happening, but very significant that it's, it's happening repeatedly. Um, in the first example here, uh, the redundancy is caught fairly early. Here's what's happening is Mark is suggesting a task to a pair of developers who actually aren't talking at this point, um, describing a particular behavior exhibited by the application that he feels is really disconcerting and therefore needs to be fixed. And he's about to say, you know, you guys go off and figure out what's wrong with this and he makes a couple suggestions for how to change it. And what's happening is that Henry, who's an old member of the XP team, but has been promoted actually, and so no longer works there day to day, just happens to be walking through the XP area at the time and here's the task proposal, immediately stops to correct Mark, telling them that actually this particular behavior is explicitly by design. There's been an extensive conversation about this behavior and that they decided to go with this because of this reason. So despite the fact that the behavior is requested, discussed upon, and agreed by a subset of the team, um, that information's either been forgotten by the team members involved in that conversation or not known at all by the people that were actually present. And hence, therefore, um, only serendipitously recovered by the fact that Henry happened to walk in at that time. In the second example, um, it doesn't get caught as early, so Sam actually spends half a day working on a task that turns out to be completely unnecessary. Here we see him at the point where he realizes it, he's reading an error message that he didn't see um, before, evidently it changed the code base that directly affects his cast for the day but that he was unaware of. Um, Sam's actually a pretty rah-rah XP guy, he's sort of one of the big like proponents on the team of, of the, the benefits of this methodology, so what he's trying to sort of weekly spin it um, here to both his partner, who's one of the newer members of the team, and me, um, is that it's sort of like an interesting things about uh, XP, what's happening here, but it's really, the team's practices are growing less effective at communicating and retaining information about technical changes due to the rapid pace of technical change, and as more people come onto the team and are making changes at the same time. Um, so as Sam puts it here, things go so fast, lots of things have changed since I looked at it last Tuesday, you know, but it sure would have helped story 1747 if he had known that. Um, and then later, as he realizes the test that he's been working on all morning is, in his words, complete crap, um, he's sort of cheerfully trying to note that, well, we only spent about half the day on this, so it's not the end of the world. But again, illustrative of the fact that, like, they're really starting to lose track of what's going on and sort of revisiting work that they've already done. Yeah. How old were the team members on the XB team? How old? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, older people have problems with memory or more lossy memory than younger. Typically. They're demographically, the median, I did the math, I think it's about the same of the two teams. Yeah. So the, the XP team actually probably a little bit younger, did you uh, see slightly. Any, any, any use of like taking notes so that they could remember for themselves as memory? Yes, practice? and we're going to talk about that in like three slides. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, so, so you're saying this code is self documenting and that by that they don't use so many comments? Mm -hmm. They don't write any, they try to avoid code comments whenever possible. Wow. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize that was part of the XP philosophy. So the XP philosophy, they have like 14 of 12 official practices, they've added two, and then there's like this whole bunch of other stuff that just comes along with it that everyone does. So comments are just seen as bad because they get out of thinking. Cross yeah. Confusion? I mean, in some sense, that's what I observed on the waterfall team is they write comments, but when they're reading code, they don't rely on those comments yep. at all. Okay. Like they'll look at the code, there'll be all these comments, and they're like, "Well, it says it does this, but who knows if it actually does that?" But they do actually write it. Yeah. Was there any um, design law that was made of the rationale for decisions on an nope. ongoing basis? The idea was that everyone would kind of remember it because they were all in the same room and they heard it, and at least one person, two people there, directly worked on it. So, no, nope, no design log. 
Uh, so in addition to this, pair switching, this practice of daily switching pairs, appears to really be muddying the waters in addition to this by increasing the amount of information a developer is exposed to as he or her switches in and out of tasks throughout the week, and in terms of knowledge transfer, fidelity, and overload. So consider the case of a module that goes through several days of alterations. On the very first day, Alice and Bob, the first two people to work on this, sit down to implement the initial design. Alice has some initial conception of the design A, and Bob will get some very closely overlapping, but not exactly the same conception of the design A prime. On the second day, the pair switch. Alice moves on to another task, and Bob will continue pairing on with Carrie to continue the messaging work. At the end of the day, Carrie now has another overlapping, but slightly different conception of design A. They'll call it A prime prime. Um, in a week later, David and Ethan are going to sit down and make another change to this module, add another feature, and because the XP programmers go to the very last person who made a change to the module for advice, right, they'll go to Carrie, and what they're going to come away with is A prime prime prime. So as you can see, what's happening is over time, understanding on a particular module gets more and more out of sync. These disconnects in the early part of the phase during the pilot study were held in check by the small team size and the fact that when you only had about five people and when you were really starting up the project, they could constantly have team-wide communication and be aware of what's going on. But as the code base gets more complex and as they bring more people on, the developers started to complain that the code base is getting more and more disjointed. And this happened on both the XP teams I saw. Okay. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they did not practice continuous refactoring? They sort of did. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the one practice that I see people say and play lip service to. They do it in the small, if you will. Like They'll be like, this test structure, these three functions really should be only two functions. And so we'll do that every time. But in terms of like these four modules should be restructured, that didn't happen so much. I mean, th and I would hear people say like we should really restructure the modules, but kind of the reality of I need to deliver the project meant that, you know, I mean, it doesn't the customer can't see that new functionality. Yeah. So it didn't happen. On that topic, um, did they have full support for refactoring, or was it the manual process? They used Eclipse, I think, okay. IDE, one of those two. But it had a lot of refactoring support okay. built into it. So yeah, they didn't have to make all the changes by hand. Um, so what I heard people saying in the course of interviews or just observations is complaining to each other that, that the code base was getting really messy and they actually pinpointed explicitly onto the fact that different understandings of particular modules were being coded into the overall code base. Like people would actually complain that, for instance, like this module's interaction with this particular messaging module doesn't make sense or isn't quite right. They, they don't quite understand what's going on here, so they've written all this code and now we have to either go back and change it or just the fact that it's, it's a huge mess for them. And one developer specifically said to me that this is not a code base I'm proud of. This is not something that I would show people on an interview because I'm not, because it's so messy. On the waterfall team, there's a slower pace of change and a strict division of technical responsibility on the developers that makes this a little bit easier. They write formal design documents, as I mentioned before, written and circulated amongst the team. Uh, once the documents are completed and the approval process for your design is completed, the documents are rarely referred to, even in the case of implementation. So it's sort of the act of writing seems to be what's going on here um, and making everyone see it for that first time. But the document provides a base for the common understanding of the design. And it's very clearly like, this is what we're going to do, this is the goal. Uh, in addition, a single developer is responsible for the entirety of a particular task. Along with the longer task development times, there means there are fewer shifts for an individual developer between tasks. They usually have one thing, it's going to range from three days to two weeks, and that's all they do for that three days. A less, timed, uh, less to track means less redundant work. Developers also have a higher fidelity understanding of the code because they usually return to the code itself when learning about new areas of the project. So on the XP team, they usually go to the person to get an explanation of what's going on and run with that. But on the waterfall team, they would actually themselves return to the code. They would only use people as a pointer to find out which parts of the code they should really be looking at. But then they would actually specifically go and very carefully read through what was happening and get their own understanding of how the code worked. Same with any new check-ins to the system. On the XP side, what you would do is you'd tell everyone in the next morning in the stand-up meeting that you made this particular change and you'd give like the three line summary of what the implications of the change were. And until you actually went and looked at that change or had to directly use that code, you kind of just took their word for it if you weren't the person who made that. On the waterfall team, whenever check-ins occur, actually everyone on the team very carefully reads through the exact line of code. So I'm kind of impressed by this. Whenever a check-in happened, you'd get all these messages afterwards that were like, oh, I see this, I fixed it for you, you know, here's this other thing that you should maybe tweak. Um, so there's a much higher fidelity of the information they're getting about the code. Um, but at the cost of much, much greater effort, right? Basically, everyone's relearning everything from scratch. So you mentioned that, that people rarely revisit the design documents. What does that mean? It means that after they write it and send it out and they go through that process of like 
you know, talking about what the features are, and they say, go, you're good, just implement what you've written. They put that document into a CVS repository, and no one ever touches it again. Okay. Except when I say, was there a design document? And they pull it out, and they send it to me. Yeah, but it's only live for that process only. Even though they do go to a great extent to maintain a cache of, of documentation. Mm -hmm. So then they're relying on their knowledge, on their memory as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of faulty memory but, of the design document. So how lossy is that memory of the design? Um, that's something I really didn't get a chance to track in the same way that the XP side did. Um, but they, like if you're the database person, you're like the database person for a year, right? So you're not swapping off as much. So my sense was that, like, you're making all the database related changes, so you're getting a chance to use that knowledge much more rapidly, right? So it's not the same situation where one day you're UI, one day you're database, one day you're, um, you know, networking, which is it on the XP team. So the way I tried to get at this is sort of an imperfect measure, but um, I think it still shows a kind of interesting um, pattern is that these two task styles and these practices are reflected in the pattern of what the knowledge on the developers on the two teams record. So this slide presents a breakdown of all the observed knowledge recording events. Um, and what I do is I kind of categorize them by the intended knowledge, or sorry, intended audience of the recorded knowledge. So are they writing this for the group as large, um, for another person or for themselves? It turns out they rarely write things explicitly for other people. Um, so I kind of omitted that category. And the intended duration of the recorded knowledge. So is it a formal design document that's intended to be archived in the long term? Or is it just an, um, a set of documents that you've written, or sorry, so like a to-do list, for instance, that's going to carry over you for the next couple days? Or is it something that you're just writing out right now to work through the logic? And so the, the time concerns on that was if it was greater than a week, I considered it long term. If it was greater than um, a couple hours, I considered it to be short term, but less than a week. And if it was a couple minutes, then I considered that to be immediate. <coughs> Um, and nearly all of the events fell into three buckets, the three that are presented here. Only two of the 150 events um, was outside of these two categories. And again, what you see are really clear differences by team. The developers on the X team externalized most of their knowledge for personal short-term use and long-term group use, whereas by far the majority of the externalization events on the waterfall team are for long-term group use, reflecting again their practice of documenting things formally for other people. Um, so the XP programmers don't write up so much stuff for the whole team, but they're writing an awful, awful lot of stuff down for themselves. No. Oh. That's counting. That's group long term. Okay, so you consider those long term even though they don't. Oh, what do you mean by checking? I mean they, they persist long. So, so I do a check in. I, I explain why. And like a CVS notification. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's counts as long-term group in this session. Okay. Because they actually have to explicitly write a message in there. Right. Yeah. What's interesting is that actually um, the long-term group on the XP side includes also check-in messages, which they also write every single time, but they never ever read them, versus the waterfall team actually reads every single one. Yeah. Where do you categorize broadcasts over Lily from the waterfall team? That one was kind of dicey, and I ended up using, I ended up putting it in the communication category rather than in explicitly recorded knowledge. Um, archive? Like, does anybody ever go back to see There's the a short archive, and so I figured when you're sending things over Lily, you're more, it functions more as a speech act than it does as a written, I'm documenting that. But I kind of went back and forth on it a little while, so you could categorize it. But, um, a lot of the distinction between externalized knowledge and communication draws on these kind of old theories of knowledge, right, that haven't really caught up to the fact that now we have email and all this other stuff. Uh, so. Um, but that's what I based it on. So, I want to be the most disruptive to these styles. It seems like the waterfall team should want to change their schedule every few months or their project. And the XP team, you'd want to put them on a long three year project. <laughs> to, to mismatch as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it's particularly, let's see, hold on. Um, the XP team does more than double, to tell you a little bit more about. These, the, the relevant category, the XP team does more than double the personal short-term notes that the waterfall does, that's percentage-wise. And the majority of these short-term personal instances are them recording information about their current task. So usually they're saying, what else do I need to do on this? I need to follow up on this issue later on. I need to, this, is, this code solution that we did is imperfect. I need to remember to tell people that we did this, this, and this. Or what else do I have to do um, before I finish? And what's particularly striking about this practice that's not reflected here 
is the consistency with which all the programmers on the XP team make these sorts of notes. On the Waterfall team, people make notes like that too, but it's actually highly variable. It's idiosyncratic. Some people make a lot of notes. Some people make no notes. Um, some people make a few notes. On the XP team, everyone makes a lot of notes, um, which suggests that the variation on the waterfall theme is sort of consistent with individual variation in me mental capacity, right? Some people just have a easier time remembering what they have to do and some people don't. Uh, versus the uniformity of the practice on the XP side suggests a much more systemic cause. That there's something about the XP practices that just makes it harder for people to remember task information. Another pretty um, interesting thing that's happening there is that the XP team never records information about past task progress. So I did see waterfall team members saying, task task progress. So in the middle of the task, the waterfall teams, I saw people saying, OK, well, I've done this, this, and this. So let me write that down, right? And I have left this, this, and this. The XP team never does that. They only say, what do we have to go next? Um, and this is, again, consistent across all the developers there. And I say that between the constant task switching that the XP team members engaged in, um, and the smaller scope of their task assignment in the practice of daily switching, they simply have more difficulty remembering task relevant information. But the fact that they have a pair partner makes it really easy for them to remember in the moment what they've already done. Like they don't feel the need to write it down because they can just always ask the guy who was right next to them who also helped them do it. And so that I think is why we don't ever see that um, in there. So let's see. Uh, developers on the waterfall team record both forms of information, although again much less frequently and somewhat idiosyncratically. So to summarize uh, sort of what I presented here today, the XP practices, particularly pair programming and open workspace, make design status and technical knowledge more transparent among members of the XP team. Um, these types of knowledge, particularly status knowledge, are less available on the waterfall team. And this is reflected in their pattern of knowledge seeking behaviors. Um, in terms of implications of this, we're kind of generalizing up. Uh, the same practices, uh, so this is sort of my ideas I've been thinking about based on these findings. So the same practices that make XP knowledgeable, uh, available to each other, also make it available for, cat for capture. And this is something I've been talking with Scott Clemmer a little bit about, is like, well, you're in this environment where people are constantly talking. So that's design decisions that that team is losing is audibly available. I mean, I know because I have them captured in my notes, right? I was sitting behind them when they were making that decision, and I could see what they were doing, hear what they were saying as they were deciding to do what they're doing. So they're losing it, but it's actually in a way that we could conceivably capture. You know, a combination of audio video, again, I've been talking to Scott to think about little ways that we can do this, but that information is out there, so there's absolutely no reason necessarily that it should just be lost the way it's currently be doing. Um, and then on the waterfall side, what this does is it points at kind of an opportunity at what they're really missing is these ways to get status about information about each other is something that they really need and that they're having to explicitly ask each other for. So there's sort of another kind of opportunity um, for either a practice or a tool-based uh, solution to that. Uh, my second summary implication, XP practice transparency allows the developers to more accurately offer information to their teammates. Um, waterfall programmers instead direct knowledge based on what they know about their teammates' activities, so the task of their day or the projects. And as I said, they have morning meetings, so they kind of know what everyone's task is for the day, and that's what they're using to make those judgments. Um, one thing that this really shows is that this opposite approach to a knowledge sharing problem, instead of one where you're making it easier for people to search for the answer, right? this idea that if you make the problem that they're doing sort of passively available to everyone else, that the answer can actually maybe come to you. And I think this is a paradigm that hasn't really been really fleshed out in many of the tool designs that we've been thinking about in terms of improving knowledge sharing activities. So I think that might be a really interesting space to start thinking about how can we structure the tools that we have or even the practice that we have to kind of encourage that more um, in different environments. Despite this transparency, the knowledge on the XP team is less permanent or more lossy. Um, they kind of point this to the idea that the XP model of collective knowledge retention rests on this maybe flawed assumptions about the human mind. Um, this knowledge loss is reflected in the increase in redundant work over time, um, task information overload and higher, and a more systemic rate of recording of task-related knowledge. And so taken together, this suggests that shorter task scope and pair rapid switches may not be such a good idea. So actually people like to say, OK, all the practices need to come together. But what these studies are starting to really show is maybe that's actually not working for you. You've got a lot of really good things going on. But here are a couple practices that really are hurting you more than they're actually helping. Mm -hmm. So you, can you identify sort of a need and a 
curve where you might want to change your practice then from XP to sort of waterfall or something in between? I haven't done that yet, but I think that's a very logical next step in terms of what we're trying to build to, right? Like, I think that, that I talked to a lot of XP developers and they've just never considered it, right? Like, they buy the whole kit and caboodle. Right, right. And it's like that, you know. But I mean, if you think about, like, what I want to do when I'm a teenager and what I want to do when I'm an adult, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, things change and you would think, like, a piece of software code when it's greenfield and it's being just when the design isn't clear and you know that's its youth and then when it gets a little bit more mature it needs a it needs something else so it seems seems reasonable perhaps mm -hmm. yeah I mean I think that's totally what I'm trying part of the bigger picture that I'm building towards uh, is saying <laughs> yeah right like I mean it makes sense like if you look at again here's where I go back to like organizational yeah. theory has like they have models for that when you transition past certain organizational forms, right? They say like there's a hierarchy model that is when your N organization is bigger, there's sort of like these different models that they have a very specific transition between yeah. organization size and these whole other factors like, you know, contingencies in the environment and environmental change. But like that's not really part of how we're thinking about software development. So I've sort of like headed there, but starting with the first step of being like, well, here's how the practices seem to be contributing on this team. And what does that say about what those factors might be? Um, does that answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It strikes me. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Oh, no. We're our, no I should stop. Go ahead. We'll talk. <laughs> okay. I didn't realize how late it got. Uh -huh. um, were you able to get any data on liver defect densities? No. Like I said, that's couldn't get the, the bug tracking or CVS data. We've done something like XP for three years, and we only do it in a small project, so they're in the range of six to 15 people total. And we have a defect rate. So we ship typically in terms of lines of code, 50,000 lines of code for a project, right? And then a similar amount of code for the unit tests. And our experience has been there's one or two set ones in each of the things we ship out of that. 50,000 lines of codes. Using XP? Well, it's a, it's a modified version. Yeah. For example, we, we do not let people swap freely, right? So we have people that focus on an area, and they stay, and then we'll pull people in. Yeah, and we don't, we only awesome. do pro, pair programming when it's really complex. We won't do pair programming <laughs> when it's just kind of like an area. So it's a, I would say it's a modified version, but it, we, we apply unit tests, and we have we do, do pair programming, but it's not, I would say it's probably 22. 30% of the time that any project is doing pair programming. Thank you. Yes. So you looked at uh, one XP project and one waterfall project. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you have actually a larger project where some part of the team works in XP, uh -huh. other part of the team works applies waterfall. Typically when you work with hardware guys, those, they design a waterfall. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether looking at your study you can reflect upon what type of practices would you recommend to make this uh, the integration of an XP team with a waterfall team um, useful? Yeah, um, the ones I recommend are that the XP team really didn't like to use systems that would make their knowledge. I mean, they didn't like to capture knowledge in any sort of formal way. Like they were sort of pushed by the company to use the bug tracking system that everyone else did because they're subject to the same support teams, right? That. Um, the rest of the companies isn't, they were driving support crazy because they would never document any bugs or respond to any bug reports on there. Um, so I think having shared systems is really important. In terms of practices, it's a bit hard to generalize from this team because I think they were a bit exceptionally isolated for an XP team. Like I did go out and try to look at a couple other XP teams in order to make sure that what I wasn't seeing was so crazy um, in terms of the practices. Like for instance, I know you guys just said that you do a bit slightly different thing. You don't switch pairs every day. Um, and they were probably, again, more isolated from the rest of the company, so it's hard to talk about what they would do to integrate a little better. Um, their whole structure was set up to be like their little world, and they kind of coped with integrating with other people by forcing them to kind of come into the XP model, which you saw with the Q&A and sort of the project management. They sort of said, come be in our cube and it was like sort of by fiat. It was just such a pain for them to get work done if they weren't in the actual area that at the end of the day they moved in, which I would not say is the optimal strategy. Um, but that's one of the things I was actually interested in. I get a lot of questions about how does XP play kind of with the rest of the company. And I think this particular study just doesn't lend itself to asking, answering those questions because they just didn't, you know, it was my way or no way at all um, on this team. Well, before we completely run out of time, let's thank Jan for an interesting talk.
All right.